Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 129. Well, stay tuned for some more from God, Heaven, and Harmageddon this week. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahi, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux of Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. Welcome back, Todd. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. Um, <laughs> I know our listeners don't know this, but this is take two. Um, take one was a miserable disaster, so hopefully this will go better. <laughs> uh, well, let's hope so. <laughs> um, but this week we get to talk about mountains, and I'm really excited about that. Yes, mountains and Eden. It's going to be fun. Good. Well, before we dive right in, our regular housekeeping uh, is to remind our listeners that we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. Um, We would sure appreciate it if you would take a few moments of your day to give us a five-star rating on iTunes and to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or whatever medium you use to download and listen to the podcast. Both of those things really help to boost our visibility to others as they're looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to pitch in a little bit of money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page. And any amount that you can give is very much appreciated. It really does encourage Todd and me. And um, just in the past two weeks, we have received more donations than normal. And so uh, thank you profusely to our donors out there. It really means a lot. Um, Todd, how would you like to kick this off this week? Well, let's start with a, a bit of a reminder of where we've been. We started with heaven itself, the creation of the heavenly realm in chapter in the beginning, and then of how that created realm called heaven, the invisible heaven, And and after that, we moved ahead to the new heavens and earth and how that created realm realm would be consummated. And then last week, we began to come down to earth in the creation of the visible realm and how the visible realm was a replica of the invisible realm. And specifically, we looked at the uh, six days of creation and how to understand that in light of the replication that was happening of the invisible realm. And so now we move chronologically forward now that we have, we're past the six days of creation and we are in uh, the Garden of Eden. And Klein begins, the title of this chapter is called The Mountain of God, which we will see why in a moment. But this portion of chapter five begins Eden as a replica of heaven. And so Klein teaches that Eden is a replica of the entire invisible glory realm that has been created. And Eden, very uniquely, would be a place of the spirit. So remember that we have the spirit hovering over creation in Genesis 1-2. And by the spirit hovering, we should understand that emanation of the spirit that would be um, visible at least to the angels, in that heavenly place. And then Klein points out we have that unique phrase in Genesis, in Genesis 3, 8, that after Adam and Eve sinned, that God came down, and some of the translations read, in the gentle wind of the day or the wind of the afternoon, the cool of the day, depending on the translation. The Hebrew word is ruach, and as many of our readers know, that word can be translated either wind or spirit, depending on the context. So Klein argues elsewhere that ruach there means spirit and not wind. And so God came not in a gentle, nice breeze, but in the spirit of judgment day. And so God comes down in the power of his spirit, which would be why Adam and Eve hid themselves. And so 
Eden then was a, a place sanctified by the spirit, a holy temple that was a replica of the holy temple in the heavenly realm. And for example, Ezekiel 28, uh, verses 13 and 14, it says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. And there's some debate who exactly is being spoken to here, at least in a typological sense. But what we do see here is that the Garden of Eden is called the Garden of God. So it uniquely belongs to God. It, it uh, demonstrates God. It's a place of his presence. And then notice you were on the holy mountain of God, which we'll get into more, that Eden was on a mountain. And then on the holy mountain of God. So on, in one sense, all creation is belongs to the Lord, he, he just created it. And yet that particular mountain is called the holy mountain of God, which would show us there's even a cult culture distinction before the fall, and that Eden is a uniquely place of the cult, a place of holy worship, of the holy presence of God. And that set apart that mountain from the common mountains, from the other mountains around the world. And so what we have here is the Garden of Eden becomes a replica of the heavenly temple, but also the personal presence of the Spirit. That is, we know that the Spirit is present in the heavenly realm. That's, that is what defines the heavenly realm. It is the Spirit's realm that we looked at a few weeks ago. But now that the Holy Spirit is projected below, as a replica of that heavenly realm is there on Eden, in the temple, a place of the spirit. And so Klein begins right away that the way we are to see Eden is a visible replica of heaven. And so our understanding of Eden is gonna expand from what we're used to thinking about. Before we go on, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is going to be um, really exciting. If you've never heard this before, if you're reading along with us, um, but yes, we are going to to learn a lot more about Eden. And I would just encourage our listeners to take the time to read that Ezekiel passage that you mentioned, chapter twenty eight, verses thirteen and fourteen. Klein is not making this up. He's not just imposing his system on the Bible, um, he, he's actually getting it from the, uh, the inspired text there. So uh, it's exciting. Yes. And so another way that Eden is a replica of heaven is that heaven was in the creation account was the source of life. It is the word that was spoken from heaven that brought life to the world. And in Genesis 13, when Lot is choosing a place to live, he sees the fertile um, ground, and the fertile grass of Sodom in that area, and it describes that as like the garden of the Lord. And so, um, like the garden of the Lord, the garden of the Lord is a place of fertility, a place that brings life. We will see later in Genesis that the rivers flow from Eden out to the rest of the world back then, again, bringing life, just like heaven brought life. And then when we come to Ezekiel 47, we have a, a picture, a, a prophecy of the new heavens and earth, and it's described as a return to the Garden of Eden. So Ezekiel 47, 12, and on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. And so you have the river, you have the tree of life um, that bears fruit for healing. All the pictures we already saw in the Garden of Eden, the, the new heavens and earth, that final eschatological temple, that heavenly realm which will come to earth, is already pictured back in the Garden of Eden. And so, as I said, we're used to thinking of Eden as only as the place that there happened to be in a test for Adam. It just happened to be in Eden. But Klein wants, to, wants us to do our biblical theology, to read everything the Bible says 
about Eden and then have a much fuller picture of what was happening at the beginning. Now, doesn't that help broaden our typical view, Chris? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, you're right. It's not um, an accidental site where they happen to just be tested by God, um, especially in that last line um, of Ezekiel 47, 12. Uh, it, it's very reminiscent of the last chapter of Revelation. Right. Yeah, in Revelation, they return, of course, at the end to the garden, mm -hmm. the paradise. And so Klein moves on in the chapter and then looks at Canaan. And he says, when you look at the land of Canaan, Canaan is a redemptive restoration of Eden. And there are many similarities. And so God is enthroned after he creates. On the seventh day, he sits on his throne and he enters his Sabbath rest. But we also see that there is a throne in a sense. There is a place where God is, is on the earth because Adam walked with God in the, in the garden. And so that was a place, just like the tabernacle was, of God's special presence. And so if he's enthroned in heaven on his Sabbath, but then there's a place on earth where he's enthroned, then that place on earth is also, in a sense, a Sabbath rest. Mm. And so Eden becomes a picture then of what will happen when we enter our final rest, when Jesus returns. And that, again, is pictured in Canaan. And so after the work of cleansing the land from the Canaanites, um, God rests in his temple. Psalm 132 8 says, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you in the ark of your might. And so once the ark was put in, in the temple, um, they invited God to come and rest there as he rested in on the seventh day. Now come and rest here as a picture of that rest. And of course, God's enthronement in heaven is called a Sabbath rest in Isaiah 66. And and in Hebrews 4, um, the rest in the land was a picture of the heavenly rest. Right. So even though the author of Hebrews says, Joshua gave you rest, there is still a rest to come. That was only a picture of that true rest. And so Eden pointed ahead to what awaited Adam and all his posterity had Adam, or if Adam would have fulfilled the covenant of works. They would enter a land of rest that was already pictured for them um, in Eden, a beautiful place where God and man would fellowship together. And so Eden is primarily a Sabbath land of rest, a replica of the heavenly rest. And that was what was being held out to man in the covenant of works. Again, that really expands our understanding of what, why God had a garden like Eden, like you said, not simply a place that there happened to be a test, but a very full picture of what would come if Adam had obeyed. Yeah, an intentional replication of the, the ultimate dwelling place of God and man together, right? Right, exactly. And so in page 42, Klein reminds us that this Sabbath rest is always a time. It's, it's a time because God rested on the seventh day. It was at the end. So Sabbath always comes at the end of work, but it's also a place. So Eden pictured the place there. And so you think of Klein's talked about before that when God, um, when, when God builds a temple for himself, it's always after a victory. And so in, the, in Genesis, in the creation account, it was victory over the waters that were covering the earth, victory over the darkness that was covering the earth. There were obstacles in the way of God and man having a place to abide together. God overcomes those, and then he rests in Eden as a picture of his rest in heaven. And then we have the same thing in Canaan, right? We have the Canaanites in the way, obstacles keeping them from inheriting the land and making it a land that is God, his theocracy. Hmm. And so through Israel, the Canaanites are defeated. The temple is built and God rests again. All of that picturing what Christ would do 
that when he rose again, because he had worked, he had won the victory of our salvation. He had defeated sin and death for us. He enters his heavenly rest, guaranteeing our presence in that final Eden. So everything is connected with Eden. And then once Adam fell, Christ would have to be the one to work to bring us back to what Eden pictured. Um, I mean, with Machen, you know, I'm just so thankful for the act of obedience of Christ because th that really seems to be the whole point of Hebrews 4, um, that we have finally found that ultimate rest because of Christ. Yes. And I don't want to get too much on a rabbit trail, but it does raise the question, and we'll talk about that in an upcoming episode, but... When we talk about, for those who are Sabbatarians, that we don't want unbelievers to work on Sunday because mm. we don't want them to break the Sabbath. Right. If the Sabbath is a picture of the heavenly rest that is only ours in Christ, is there any way an unbeliever can keep the Sabbath? Yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, um, if heaven is not their inheritance, then how can they violate something that pictures an inheritance that is not theirs. And if this raises a lot of questions with our listeners, hold on for a few weeks because we're coming to that whole chapter on the Sabbath. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's move on to mountains because as we move to the next sec section called the mountain of God in Eden, Klein takes us to Isaiah fourteen thirteen which says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. And so in one sense, in these two passages, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, he's speaking to the king who has exalted himself. But in both passages, the king reminds the author of either Satan or Adam. Depends on how you want to interpret this. I tend to believe it's about Adam because it's Adam who wanted to be like God and then he was exiled out from God's presence. Hmm. But that, that was also true of Satan, though it's a little tougher to think how he was exiled out of the garden in the same way Adam was. But whether you take it uh, Adam or Satan as the sort of the type behind the king, mm -hmm. the point... Um, Klein wants to make is that there's a mountain here called the Mount of Assembly at the very beginning. And that Mount of Assembly in Hebrew is Har Moed. And in the Greek, of course, that's Harmageddon, the name of this book. And so Klein says, here we are introduced to the mountain that the Garden of Eden is on. And here it's called the Mount of Assembly. And the Mount of Assembly, well, who assembles on the mountain? Well, first it would be, Klein says, the judicial council. The angels and the three persons of the Trinity uh, together um, in heaven. And so that mount of assembly becomes a picture of entering the very presence of God in heaven. Hmm. And Klein writes that as, as it's called the mount of assembly, what we can speculate is this is what would happen if Adam had not violated the covenant of works. If Adam would have kept the covenant um, during the time that they were obeying the dominion mandate and filling the earth, that there would be times of worship and they would come and assemble at the mountain where Eden was. And, and it would be Adam's role, of course, to keep guard and um, cultivate that garden to make that temple beautiful. By the way, very similar to the Levites and their role with the temple later on, which would picture Eden in a sense. So the point is, Klein says, that we have a mountain of assembly at the beginning, and it's also called the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. And Zaphon often means the utmost heights or the heights. And so again, the idea is that Eden would be a place that would be like you're entering heaven itself. You would go up the mountain to God's presence and you would worship him. And the mythical version, Klein says of that, Mount Zaphon, is that was also the throne of Baal, which was on a mountain. 
Oh, okay. And so Psalm 48, 2 puts these two mountains together in one image. Beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth, like the heights of Zaphon is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. And so Klein notes that when you connect all the mountains like this, you have the mountain, which is Eden, which was an amount of assembly. You have Mount Sinai, where God was present in a unique way with his spirit and the people assembled for worship. And then you have the temple being built on Mount Zion, where God was present uniquely by his spirit and the people assembled. All of these mountains is an earthly replica of heaven be in the highest place. And so we don't often think of Eden as a mountain. For one reason is most of us, when we build a garden, or we tend a garden, it's not on a mountain. <laughs> right. It's usually it's somewhere flat. But there are places on mountains, especially with plateaus, that you can uh, build a nice uh, garden and you can tend one and, and it gets lots of rain. And so... We should think in terms of a mountain, and then Klein says we shouldn't even think of one of those little mountains that you see in Israel. You know, the, what are called mountains in Israel, the Mount of Olives, are, are actually, for most of us who live around mountains, they would be hills. <laughs> you could probably run up them in 15 minutes. <laughs> but still, they were mountains. You had to go up, and, and you could overlook the entire valley from these places. So it was a lofty place. But Klein spec speculates that the mountain that was Eden was actually higher. And he, and he says, even there are some verses that talk about as the clouds are on the very tips of the mountain, when you get to the clouds, those most picture the presence of God in heaven. And so granted, there is some speculating here, but I don't think you can get away from all these verses that speak of a mountain, that we should understand this mountain garden as a replica of the heavenly temple. Hmm. Agreed. Um, I heard a, a pastor preach a sermon once um, where he said that most people look at Armageddon in the book of Revelation, what Klein is uh, rendering Harmageddon and saying that people tend to tie that to Megiddo in Israel and that, you know, when you, when you look at the topography of that area called Megiddo, that there's no mountain. Um, and I don't know, what do you, what do you make of what he's up to there? Well, it's a great question. The only reason I'm going to hold off is that's in the next chapter of the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping up my <laughs> reputation. <laughs> He has a whole section on how Megiddo, which is a valley, is not um, Harmageddon, which is a mountain. Okay. And he will show some of the mistakes that have been made um, from trying to equate the two. So we'll get to that actually in the next episode. Good. Okay. But now we're going to get to one of our favorite topics, republication. Yes. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's go. And so we have talked about this before, but Klein goes on to point out that since Canaan, Canaan recapitulates Eden, we should also see the covenant of works arrangement in both as a republication of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And so when you compare Eden with Canaan, what do you see? In both places, there were theocratic orders. Yep. They, they were to live according to the revealed law of God. And so... Both places, there was a sanctuary at the very center, and they were told, man was told to guard and protect it. And so as Adam was to guard the sanctuary, so the Levites were to guard God's sanctuary, his presence. Both were presented as paradise lands, the Garden of Eden, obviously, but also Canaan, when it speaks of a land flowing with milk and honey. That's a paradise picture. Both lands were to be cultivated and enjoyed. As God said, from any tree you can eat, except for this one. Both had a covenant of works as the, um, sort of the, the only way they could remain in the land and not be exiled out if they fulfilled the covenant of works. 
course, the covenant with God and Adam in the garden and the covenant between God and Israel. Um, and Israel was exiled when they broke as a nation, the covenant between God and Israel, just like Adam and Eve were exiled when Adam broke the covenant arrangement. And then at least his final point, both of these arrangements were done on mountains. <laughs> and so the first covenant of works was given on Mount Eden. And Zion becomes a restoration of the holy mountain. And so the purpose then of the whole picture that is Israel was to drive them for their need for Jesus Christ. Mm. Because if you, because when we read Genesis 3, the whole fall happens very quickly. And so, in a sense, God is showing us a, a much larger picture. If you want to see the sinfulness of sin, here is a people that God has redeemed from Egypt. He has shown them his power, put them in a land where they have now peace, he promised to be their God, given them their law. And let's see if they as a nation obey. And sure enough, before long, they are serving and worshiping other gods. So if you want to see why man is utterly sinful and he cannot earn his way to heaven, he needs a righteousness outside of himself, here is a replication of the, everything that happened in Eden, this time with the sun, not Adam being the sun, but Israel being the sun. And we're going to see this all over again from start to finish. Israel is a new creation they're put in a garden land. They're given the covenant of works. And like Adam, quoting Hosea 6, 7, like Adam, they break the covenant and they're exiled out of the land, out of the garden. And so now you see why Jesus has to come and he has to be our righteousness and he has to take on the curse because there's no other way. We're utterly sinful. And so republication, the purpose of republication is to show us what happened in the fall in a very vivid picture to drive us to our only hope, Christ. Amen. And so I'm not sure why people struggle so much re <laughs> with republication as if it introduces some kind of actual works principle for salvation. It's the very opposite. Right. It's showing that nobody can fulfill a works principle. It was doomed from the start. That Israel should have uh, immediately recognized their inability to do this and pleaded with God for a better Israel, who now, from our vantage point, we know was Jesus. I mean, it's not an accident that he came into time-space history as um, a Jewish person. I mean, he was the, the true Israel. Yes, and, and you look at the first five chapters of Matthew, he's pretty much replicating the whole life of Israel. Right. As they were saved from Egypt, Jesus goes down to Egypt and is brought back to the promised land. As they go through the Jordan River, Jesus is baptized. In, I'm so, sorry, as they go through the Red Sea, Jesus is baptized in the river. As Moses goes up the mountain, Jesus goes up the mountain and gives God's um, new covenant ethics instead of the law of Moses. Jesus is recapitulating the life of Israel, showing that he's the one that is going to merit God's blessings, right. since we cannot. Well, And then, I mean, the, the real culmination of all of that is his temptation in the wilderness, isn't it? Yes, I'm glad you, you added that. And so Jesus is in the wilderness 40 days to remind us how Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. But as Israel often complained and groaned, Jesus never did. Mm. He is the true Israel that will fulfill the law for us. And so Klein wants us to make one more connection to the mountain as he quotes um, Isaiah 2, 1 and 2, which says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. And Klein's point is that if Eden was a mountain that pictured 
the final eschatological place with God and man, that place is even described as a mountain in Isaiah. And so that mountain theme will come back a number of times. Do you want to move on or any other thoughts? Um, no, let's go ahead and move on. Okay. So we move in, move on to Ezekiel 28 again. And Klein is saying, since it's describing Eden, the more we learn from Ezekiel 28, the more we can learn from what was going on in Eden and how it was a replica of heaven. And so Eden is described as an opulent place, shining with the glory of God. Gemstones are described here in Ezekiel 28. Again, the, the glory, the brightness coming from the gemstones as a replication of the glory of heaven. And then it says in Ezekiel 28, as we move on, stones of fire were on the mountain. And Klein reminds us how we saw coals of fire among the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision. And of course, you had flames on the altar in the Isaiah 6 vision. Mm -hmm. And so putting these together, when heaven is pictured, there's the brightness of fire um, from these gemstones. And of course, the king of Tyre is thrown down from the mountain in this Ezekiel 28 vision. Again, he can be pictured as a mountain. And so, and then Genesis 2, the rivers flow down from the mountain, again, suggesting it must be a mountain, there's at least some elevation for the rivers to flow out of Eden uh, to the rest of the land. And so, from this point on, I'm hoping, I th the point is when you picture Eden, start to picture a mountain and, and the closest thing that they would see to the heavenly realm, pictured in this garden on the mountain. Okay. I'm stopping to get any other thoughts, wisdom, teaching, rebuke, anything you got. <laughs> uh, well, I was just thinking, um, you know, we've got this king of Tyre uh, being thrown down from a mountain. And I, to my mind, it fits Adam really well just because of the ruling language that we encounter in Genesis 1 where, I mean, yes, there are creature kings that are supposed to rule over creature kingdoms, but Adam ultimately is set up as um, God's representative king, you know, among all of God's creation to rule over everything. Um, that's the, the thought that came to mind. Yes. And a lot of those connections we're going to find as we move on in the book. Okay. Um, listeners, this book just gets better and better. So <laughs> agree. He, he just keeps connecting more dots throughout the Bible. As we move forward, uh, we move on next week from Eden. So, one more section before we finish, and that is called the Eden Mountain being the sacramental icon of heaven. And so Eden was to be the spiritual center of the world. It would be the connection to heaven of for Adam and his posterity. If they had not fallen, they would see a reminder whenever they came there of what was waiting for them um, once the earth had been filled. And so Klein has a suggestion, and it's only a suggestion, but given what we see in Canaan, that when the temple was built and God's presence was there, the Israelites were told when they pray, they should face the temple. So wherever they are in Israel, they would face the direction of the temple. And so Klein suggests that that probably would have happened um, as the earth was being filled, that since Eden would be the place of worship, the place of God's presence, that all the people would pray to the Lord facing the mountain. Mm. But definitely the mountain becomes a sacramental access, access point. That would be the place where the throng would have come to worship, to ascend the mountain where Adam had been continually building up and beautifying the temple as he was required to do. And there they would worship God. And there would be the special presence of God's spirit. And so the mountain becomes 
a connecting point to heaven, and the mountain also becomes a source of life or death that we receive from heaven because the dual sanctions of the covenant of works came from there. Whether they live eternally or they die came from that place. And so it's a place of, of life. It's a place of connection to heaven. It's a covering of God's presence. Klein writes like the Shekinah glory was over Israel with a cloud, that cloud that presence of the Spirit in, in Eden would have been a reminder of God's protection and covering of them. And so Eden would be a temple, a mountain fortress, Klein calls it, a refuge, and the connecting point between earth and heaven. Klein even suggests that as the people would come to worship, they would look up, and as they made their way to the garden, there would be slopes that formed passageways, and those would be sort of a way to ascend to heaven. It would, it would remind them that they have access to the heavenly realm one day and that the God of heaven they have access to in worship and knowing his love. And so it's interesting that in after the fall in common grace, you have the non-believers when they build their temples, the ziggurats, how do they build them? They build them as staircases. And so it's, it's very likely that at least in common grace from the, the oral reports passed down from creation on, there was some understanding that God was received, he was worshiped on, in a high place. And so how did they build their temples? As staircases to heaven. Hmm. And Klein ends this section by re, um, taking us to Jacob's dream where there's another... Um, staircase to heaven. This time the angels are coming down from heaven first. So the idea there is now man cannot ascend because of sin. God would have to descend in order to fellowship with man. So already we have the cross being pictured here. We have God becoming a man being pictured that God would make a way that he would have to come down first and then bring man back up to heaven. Right. And so Jesus, even in that picture, also in Psalm 24, we have this picture of, of the people coming up a mountain and they see the palace of the Lord, but the gates are shut and nobody can open the gate. Nobody is worthy to gain access to God's presence. And so it's a very sad Psalm because it says, who can enter the temple of the Lord? Only those with clean hands and a pure heart. Well, everybody looks around and, and nobody has that. And then the psalm goes on and says, who is this? The king of glory has appeared. Open the gates. And in this beautiful picture, the gates open up and this king of glory walks through the gate. And the picture would be the gates remain open for everyone else to follow him. And who is this king? It's the Lord of glory. It's God himself as a man who has opened the gates for us. Psalm 24, you better present it as the gospel, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've heard this before in terms of the question being posed, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And, uh, well, I know that we're supposed to, you know, see Jesus here, but the, the truth is that you can too. And um, I know my own sinfulness en enough to know that... Um, I don't have clean hands and a pure heart, and that rules me out. So I'm I'm always encouraged to hear you um, reference Psalm 24 because um, it means that Jesus has um, really secured my um, my passage into God's palace. Yeah, I remember watching a preacher on television just butcher Psalm 24 and pretty much preach it the way you just said. Ugh that you better be walking with God and you better be living a righteous life if you want him to receive you in his presence. And now he describes Psalm 24 as sort of what happens in a quiet time. That <laughs> If you come to God um, and you've already repented of all your sin and you're living a righteous life, then you can have fellowship in a quiet time with him. Otherwise, he will not receive you. And I wanted to pull what little hair I have left out of my head. <laughs>
if you don't see this as the act of obedience of Christ, I mean, the whole, all the people are helpless until the King of Glory opens the gates himself. Right. I mean, how, if you mess that up, stay away from the Bible. Just walk away and don't hurt us anymore. And the pulpit and everything. Just stay away from it all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go to church, but stop talking. <laughs> Well, it's a good place to end. It's a good reminder of Hebrews 12 that in our simple worship services, wherever we meet, indoor or outdoor, or um, whether we have money for a building or not, when we meet through Jesus Christ and faith in him, then we enter our worship. We are entering and approaching the heavenly mountain. God meets with us. He receives us. Just as we are, as it says, if we trust in Christ for salvation, that simple worship service is a glorious thing because we worship at the heavenly mountain, as Hebrews 12 describes. And so I'm reminded of a quote from C.S. Lewis where he writes, the perfect church service would be one we were almost unaware of. Our attention would have been on God. Yep, exactly. And so it's important to remember that even in all of our weaknesses and distractions and imperfections, Hebrews says, if we come trusting in Christ as our access, not in ourselves and in our goodness, but in Christ, we are received into heaven itself, that we are by faith at the heavenly mountain. And God is meeting with all his people around the world. It makes a simple worship service a glorious thing, doesn't it? It really does. And... Just to tie it back in with everything that we've discussed in this episode, um, it's not going back to Eden. I mean, we've talked about how Eden is a mountain, um, Z- Mount Zion is a mountain, and Mount Zaphon is a mountain. Um, but the, I mean, the mountain where we are meeting God is the the invisible heavens, um, which was being replicated in Eden but but now I mean we're meeting him by faith in that um that ultimate invisible heavens and uh wow what a what a great note to end this episode on yes and I, and I do remind young pastors that to remember that we don't have to try to replicate heaven in our service what we think heaven will be mm. we are received there through Christ in all of our weakness And so sometimes, you know, I I see young pastors and when they enter the pulpit, they'll pray in this new preacher heavenly voice. They're sort of yelling. (laughs) And I'll think, okay, I know God isn't hard of hearing. So you you don't have to scream the prayer. But I think in their minds, they're trying to be respectful with the understanding we're in heaven. Mm. And so we have to remember while that's true, God receives us in the weakness of being on the earth. We're still um, struggle with attention and with noises and with things breaking down and weakness. And we don't have to replicate the strength of heaven. And in essence, that's what Pentecostalism is. It's a rushing of heaven to the earth. They want you to feel now what they expect you to feel in heaven. And Mm. so they sort of force it instead of, being reminded that even when we don't feel all the time and our feelings are all over the place, we're still in God's presence by faith and he's still feeding us because he's promised to. But we don't have to try to force it down in a sense. Right. It's already there in Christ and that's what's so important to remember. Excellent point. Well, let's stop there and then we can move on from Eden next week. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Todd. I really, really enjoyed that discussion. It was it was exciting to talk about the Lord. Always is. Yes, and we will be back again next week with chapter six. Um, please do email us your questions, uh, your comments, your thoughts at glorycloudpodcast at gmail dot com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. The podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. You can also join the discussion at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added. 
And Todd and I will be back again next week with more of God, Heaven, and Armageddon.